uh, Dr. Kostman is our distinguished keynote as we round out the session today. Dr. Kostman is a data scientist, mathematician, and psychologist, and widely recognized as being one of the world's leading experts in applied artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. JT has hunted down terrorists for the U.S. intelligence agencies, tracked criminal networks for the FBI, and advised an, on analytic strategies for the Department of Defense. In the corporate sector, JT has served as a Chief Data Officer for Time Incorporated, Chief Data Scientist for Samsung, and he has led the development of AI and frontier technologies for scores of companies from the Fortune 500 to Silicon Valley startups. Dr. Kosman is the CEO and co-founder of Protected by AI and the inventor of CodeLock. Please join me in welcoming Dr. J.T. Kosman. Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Uh, auspicious gang to chase after, particularly given my topic today. I was told I'm talking to you about, let's see, oh, my recent research on quantum neuromorphic computing applications to AI, <laughs> stochastic gradient descent models, and particle swarm optimization, right? Okay. That's actually a lecture I gave last week up in Boston. I'm just messing with you. No, I'm here to talk to you today about something much more important. I'm here to talk to you today about you. I'm here to talk to you today about how the world is changing and changing faster than it ever has before in, our, in human history, possibly in the history of the planet, and how we can keep up and how we can take advantage of some of those changes and introduce them into our organizations. Now, whenever I talk about change, I always think about this thing. Can you see that from the cheap seats? All right, I'll put it up on the screen. If you're under 30, raise your hand if you know what this is. I check IDs, people. If you're under 30, raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay, if you're over 30, raise your hand. Oh, okay, we all know what this is. Those of you who are under 30, this is something we used to put in our records. Records were these round things made of vinyl. They went around and around and they would make music would come out of them? Yes, we used to put those in our records. Let me tell you about this one, though. I happened to find this one when I was in Seattle, Washington, a long time ago, probably about 15, 18 years ago. And I remember how long ago it was because I put it in my pocket when I found it in a record store, records. And when I came home, I'm sitting on the couch with my wife and my son, who's still a teenager at the time. I think he's like 15 or 16 years old. And I reached into my pocket and I told my wife, oh, Ange, look what I found when I was in Seattle. She said, oh my gosh, I haven't seen one of those in years. And my son, you know, surly 15 year old, he looks at and he says, well, what's that? And Angie, my wife says, oh, we used to put those in our 45s. And he said, you had guns? <laughs> no, we didn't have guns. Well, actually, yeah, your mother did have guns. See, she comes from Nevada. If you know the map of Nevada, you have Reno, Carson, uh, Las Vegas, she's from here, somewhere in the middle of the desert. Yeah, they had guns back then, but we're not talking about those. We had guns because, well, we had guns. We had 45 inserts because you needed them to play your records. Quick question, anyone who recognizes those things, why didn't they just make the holes smaller in the record? I don't know. But the times, even back then, this came out, by the way, 1964. Then Bob Dylan was crooning about how the times, they are a changing. And man, he didn't know nothing about changing times. Think about how much times have changed during our lifetime. And I think about, when I think about that, I think music is a great measure and metric for that. Pardon the pun. But I think music is a great way to really think about change. We moved, during my lifetime at least, we moved beyond 45s. We stopped listening to vinyl. We stopped listening to records. What was the next medium? What was the next thing we, listen, we used to listen to music? Eight-track tapes, that's right, eight-track tapes. What can't, you remember what a musical experience that was, by the way, right? Tick, click, 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 in the middle of the track. What came after those? What was after the eight-track? Cassette tapes. Who didn't sit there when they were a kid with a pencil trying to put the damn thing back in the cartridge, right? What came right after that? This is a trick question. Do you remember? Just before 
we had the Walkman. You remember the Walkman? It was like this incredible music experience, right? I feel like I'm there at the concert. It's the devil's own music. Yes, then we had these. Then we had CDs. Do you remember CDs when they first came out? I remember the day I'm walking down King's Highway in Brooklyn, New York, and in front of Crazy Eddie's, which is the big music store at the time, there's this idiot pouring lighter fuel on them and saying, you can light them on fire and they'll still play. I still don't know why you'd want to do that, but they're showing these things are practically indestructible. Most of us in this room grew up with CDs, right? But what came next? What is there now? Right. Music now is digital. And digital, I'll offer, is different. Digital is fundamentally different. Why? Because digital is no longer a simulation. It's no longer a copy. It simply is. If I take a copy, do you, anyone remember making that mixtape? Right? <laughs> and how crappy that came out? Right? Try copying a vinyl record. Terrible. But with data, digital is data. And with data, your copy isn't a copy anymore. In fact, we can't call it a copy. It's just a simple... A, a, Another of the original. If I told you right now in data 010101 and you repeat that back to me, what's changed? Nothing. Digital is fundamentally different because not only is it different in quality, we can do things with that digital. We can do things with data that we were never able to do before. We have information now and that information is something we can process and we can use. This is when everything started to change, right around this same time. If you think about the history of technology, I came along just slightly after the car, but I certainly came along before the men, first man landed on the moon. Does anyone remember what day? Not Steve, he knows. What day did man land on the moon? July 20th, 1969, exactly. And you remember when that happened? We were sitting out there, those of us old enough to remember, looking up and thinking, oh my goodness, we've actually done this. I was asking my grandpa-in-law, which I think is an official title, I asked my grandpa-in-law, who at the time was 93, marbles were all there. He grew up also in that little town in Nevada. And he actually, when he was a child, they didn't have cars yet. His first trip into the big city of Ely, Nevada. Anyone ever hear of Ely, Nevada? Exactly. His big trip into that town, he had to take with a horse and wagon because cars hadn't been invented yet. I asked him once, do you think, Grandpa, I'm teaching about this at the university now. I'm talking about how things have gotten faster and faster. Do you think that's true? He said, oh my goodness, yes. Ever since men landed on the moon, things have really sped up. And I'm realizing, this is a guy who was too old to fight in World War II. When he's talking about men landing on the moon, to him, this is relatively yesterday. Think about what's happened since then, though. We've seen this absolute and utter explosion. The times they have started to change, and we have been forced to change with them. Right? I learned to code, and I'll put a little bit of a date on myself. I learned to program computers on this machine. I kid you not. This is an IBM 1620, and we had to use Hollerith punch cards to program this thing. I actually, my wife will tell you I'm a huge pack rat. I keep everything. And I actually have the ops manual for this, so I looked it up before I came here today. And I said, what was the speed? What was the capability? And it bragged about, in bold letters with exclamation point, that it could process up to 60,000 digits, which I think you can put in one cell in Excel now. And it said the speed of this thing was 0 0.007 megabytes, which that's the only James Bond thing about this machine, I can guarantee you. But think about not just how technology has changed, but how our work has changed along with it. And in fact, I'll argue that has been one of the biggest changes in our life, in our professional lives at least. When I think of the professional world and how the professional world has changed, our work world, I'm former military. I heard several people saying very kind things about the military. I'm former U.S. Army Special Forces. Everybody, who? Oh, oh, very good. Any other vets out there? All right, so you won't tell anyone I can lie as much as I want. Awesome. And when I think about the military and I think about changes, I'm forced to think about the delta forces of change. You get that, right? Yeah. Delta. When I think of the delta forces, I think of the D, the demographics. Those of you who are in an age old enough to know what this little thing is, how many of you remember when the workplace looked very different demographically than it looked right now? Can you imagine when you're back in the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, organizations that had 
women in positions of power, people of color. Oh my gosh, LGBTQ, we didn't talk about that, right? We didn't talk about any of it. Think about the demographic shifts we've seen. But those weren't the only changes we've seen. Think of the economic changes we've seen, right? We have witnessed globalization has happened on our watch. While we were sitting here, the economy of the world has shifted dramatically. And I'll argue the economics in every industry and sector have changed dramatically over not even the last 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, five years. And they're continuously in motion. It's changing more and more every day. One of my least favorites, the legal and regulatory changes. How many of you are impacted on a daily basis by legal and regulatory changes, right? Oh my goodness, this is the bane of our existence, but this is happening every day. Has anyone ever seen the regulations claw back and get smaller? I don't think so, right? This is cumulative. This keeps growing and growing and growing. But the two biggest impacts we've seen, I think, are from these two. From technology, which is what we'll talk about today, but we're also going to talk about the A, which is attitudes and values. Think about how much that's changed since we've been in the workforce. When we joined the workforce, and your boss said to jump, what was the only possible answer? No. That was and how high and how fast, and you'd keep jumping. Try that now. Get a Gen Z, get even a younger millennial, and tell them to start. No, it doesn't work that way. They bring different attitudes, different values to work, a different perspective entirely. One that we have to start getting used to, and we have to start contending with more effectively, because guess what? They're the ones who leverage that technology, and that technology is what giving us wings and able to fly as organizations. I started getting interested in this. I can actually remember the date when I started getting interested in this. I was, I told you I learned to code in the, I didn't tell you the date, the late 60s, early 70s is when I was first working with computers. And I always had this passion and this love for computers and technology, but I also had to support a wife and family, and so eventually a family. And my job initially in technology paid horribly. I, my first job in technology was as a computer. Not working on computers, I was a computer. That used to be a job title. I was a computer for several years, and it was a horrible job. They put you in the basement, it was hot, it was noisy, and they treated you like crap, you were the bottom of the barrel. And I did that for a while, and then I got out of it and I started to do more interesting work. I ended up in the military, in US Army Special Forces, and loved my time there. I was still working with computers. I was working with the intelligence community and still helping them come over this hump that they were coming over to learn about how to implement technology effectively to gather intelligence and disseminate intelligence more effectively to support the military. It's probably work I would have done forever, but too many bombs and bullet holes and broken bones, and I was finally medically discharged. Uh, I remember the day I got discharged from the military. It was July 6, 1993. And I'm laying there in a bed at Silas B. Hayes Memorial Hospital, Fort Ord, California. And my wife is sitting with me. We're waiting for the doctors to come in and say, you're done. And needless to say, I'm in a bit of a funk, a little bit depressed. And so she's sitting there and she's reading a New Yorker magazine, one of the docs had left behind. And she comes across a cartoon in that New Yorker magazine that changes my entire life. Here's the worst part. Most of you know this cartoon. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Peter Steiner. And my wife said to me, handed me the cartoon. And I said, On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Why not? Why don't they know if your nose is wet and your toe is wet and if you have spots or not? She said, Well, you're smart. Figure it out. That challenge, I kid you not. I actually have spoken to Peter Steiner. He gave me permission to actually use this cartoon. This cartoon, by the way, I found it just sold uh, as the highest selling cartoon in history. I have free rights to use it forever. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Steiner regrets it. But I started thinking about this. I started thinking about that intersection of technology and psychology. How could you gain insights into people, into humans, into what we do individually, collectively, organizationally, and how could you use technology both to leverage those insights and to enable those people to be able to be more effective? And that's really where most of my work took me. I started working at that intersection. I finished my first PhD in psychology, my second in mathematics, 
and continue to work with computers ever since. That led to some interesting experiences, you can imagine, trying to understand really how the human mind works, and most importantly, how we could even simulate that in computers. You thought I was kidding about that title of the talk. Literally, that's a, title, a talk I gave in Boston last week, talking about this intersection of where technology and psychology and bits and brains and computers and cognition, where these things intersect so that we can take advantage of them. And so that, frankly, we don't have to be afraid of them. And fear, I found, is pervasive. I was, after I got out of the military, I went to grad school, I finished my degrees, yay. I went to work for Gallup, the Gallup organization. I became their research director, and I did a, some interesting work with them. I was really enjoying myself, 9-11. I'm one of the people who 9-11 fundamentally changed my life, and in a kind of an odd way. A Couple of months after 9-11, I'm at home one day when I get a call from a guy I've never heard of before named James Clapper. Does anyone know the name? James Clapper became appointed the first director of national intelligence. And he called me one day and he said, hey, you may have heard we had this incident, 9-11, uh-huh. <laughs> paying attention to the news, and we need you to come down and help us. Why? Why do you need me? What help do you need? Well, here's the problem. The problem is we had the data. We had all the information. We just didn't know how to access it and to use it. And I listened to him and I heard him out and I said, you know, your problem isn't a technology problem. Your problem is a socio-technical problem. Your problem is getting people and machines and the systems to work integratively, interactively. To which he unceremoniously said, why do you think I'm calling you? Because you're a geek, you're a shrink, and you still have your clearances. Okay. <laughs> so, and he told me, I'm actually going to give you a choice which is unusual for the intelligence community. Uh, you can come down and you can work with us and I can do one of two things. I can either still order you back in the uniform or I can give you a big bag of money. I went for door two. <laughs> Actually, more importantly, my wife went for door two. And I went down in the Beltway and I worked with the national Intelli US intelligence community and I worked across all 18 agencies to try to get them to collaborate, to coordinate it, to share information, to create technological systems they could access. But more importantly, this is actually the slide I would use when I was talking at DIA, CIA, MOUSE, LNMOP, whatever <laughs> letter I had. I would show them this, and I would say, here's the biggest problem we have, is this. You're like a bunch of children See, they're sticking your tongues out at one another. You got to get over it for the good of the country, right? We've got to do something. And very much to their credit, they came together. The level of coordination, collaboration would astound you pre and post 9-11. We, you can all sleep very safely at night. Those of you who think we've gotten lucky, no. I will keep you up at night for the rest of your life with some stories. We don't have time for them today, and most of them would have me living with Snowden in Russia and I have no desire to move to Russia. I actually did a postdoc at Moscow State University in Russia. I was already working with the intelligence community. I can't believe they let me in the country. That's a whole other story for another time. But what I got to see firsthand up close when I came in was really the, the birth of the modern incarnation of artificial intelligence and how we could start using this for ourselves as organizations. And organizations, I came to find out, are really no different. There's a lot more red tape and it's a lot more bureaucratic working with DOD than it would be, I hope, working with Marsh McLennan. But other than that, organizations are organizations. You still have people, you still have technology that can enable them. So how do you bring these things together and how do you work effectively to be able to do that? And how do you leverage this extraordinary technology to be able to do that? And when I say extraordinary, this is not my words. Sundar Pichai, the, Google, the CEO of Google, recently said, I'm quoting him here, artificial intelligence is the most important thing humanity is working on. It's more profound than electricity or fire. I think fire might be pushing a little bit, but it really is a profound difference in organizations. And I'll tell you, it also scares the hell out of organizations. It scares the hell out of government entities. I work with companies and countries around the world. I work with the government of South Africa. I work uh, 
well, with the UAE, I work with Israel, I work with countries all over, and I work with companies all over the world, and the common denominator is people are scared to death of this notion of AI and AI taking over. And I'll tell you, some of it is not unfounded. We see that AI is starting to play a role. AI, machine learning, robotization, they're all of the same tree, and we're seeing people getting pushed out of their jobs. And we're seeing not just in manufacturing organizations, we're seeing in factories, when people are working on these things, we're able to replace them with the robots. And in fact, here's my new favorite. I collect motorcycles. Uh, I have a very indulgent wife, and she lets me buy a new motorcycle every year. Here's what I told her I want this year. I want Baxter instead of a motorcycle. She actually said yes. I can get Baxter. Baxter is not a robot. He's actually technically called a cobot. And the reason he's called a cobot is he works hand in glove with you. The way Baxter learns and the way Baxter works is you literally stand him by you and you show him what you're doing and he does it too. And eventually he gets better and faster than you. You give him instructions or you even just let him watch you. He gets better and faster. Here's my favorite thing about Baxter though. Baxter costs 22K, less than a good quality motorcycle. <laughs> Much less, if my wife asks, than a good quality motorcycle. <laughs> 22 grand, and from what I understand, Baxter doesn't call in sick, he doesn't sue you, he doesn't even take bathroom breaks, and he's never sexually harassed anyone that I'm aware of. <laughs> this is a great employee, potentially, right? But it's not just in the factories, it's not just in the warehouse, it's not just Amazon using these things to pick and pack orders. No, we're starting to see a pervasion of robots, bots, AI, machine learning across every industry and sector. The biggest impact we're seeing right now is white collar jobs. White collar are increasingly moving out of their jobs because they're being replaced by robots. I'll get back to this and talk about this in a few minutes. But no lesser light than Warren Buffett, I actually had a conversation, surreally, with Warren Buffett. I was in Omaha when I was working with Gallup. And he, I asked him, what does he think about this? And he said, which he's now become famous for, he said, when I think about the firm of the future, I think eventually you're going to have a big computer, a man, and a dog. And the man's job will be to feed the dog, and the dog's job will be to keep the man the hell away from the computer. <laughs> I don't know that he's wrong. I don't know that he's wrong. We're seeing more and more roles replaced more and more aspects of work replaced. And in fact, if you read the papers or read the research and reports on this, Oxford came out recently with a study where they looked at jobs all across, the, all across the world, all across different industries, different sectors, and here's what they come up, came up with. They said they think 47% of jobs are currently at risk of automation, 40% of all jobs. But you know what? They're wrong. And I'm going to explain to you why they're wrong. We put a caveat on that, little asterisks. They're wrong for a number of reasons. And even if they're right, it's still going to be OK. And I'll tell you why it's OK. Are you familiar with what's called the lump of labor fall fallacy? Lump of labor fallacy is essentially something that you'll hear in the press every day, them committing this fallacy and saying, migrants and old people uh, and, and machines are going to take our jobs. It's so stupid. Right? They're all going to take our jobs from us. We've got to be careful that the people don't come in, the machines don't come in and they'll take all our jobs. No. The economy historically always, every generation, every couple of years, we get a new technology and it replaces people. And guess what? People go on to do better jobs. Right? The cotton gin didn't put a whole bunch of people out of work. Cars didn't. In fact, when my father was a young man, the most populous job in New York, Los Angeles, Boston, and Chicago was stevedore. Do you know what a stevedore is? Raise your hand. It was the most populated job, the most common job in those major cities in the US and abroad. A stevedore is someone who picks things up and takes them off of ships. Load ships, unload ships. We got rid of stevedores. You know how? <laughs> Forklifts, containers. Right? They put all the stevedores out of work in just a couple of years. In fact, literally, stevedores went from the biggest employer, uh, employment opportunity to no employment opportunity in the span of about three years. By the way, one of my other favorites, the Pony Express. 
was replaced by the telegraph literally overnight. Literally. It was running full capacity one day. They initiated the telegraph. Well, that won't work. Uh, I know that because I'm from Carson City, uh, from Nevada, where we have Carson City as our capital, Kit Carson, right? And <laughs> they're still telling the story. Oh, those poor Pony Express writers that'll work. No, no, it's ridiculous. If for no other reason, some of the computers don't actually want to do the work. Some of the work is horrible, right? I love this cartoon. So in summary, everyone is fine except for you, Colin. Not even the robots want your job. <laughs> I'd like to be, I'm Colin, right? But when I talk to people about AI, the question I always get is, aren't you afraid of this, the rise of the robots? What about the Terminator? Which incidentally, we've had T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and now T6 since 1984, uh, which is an auspicious year for them to start the Terminator movies. I tell people the only way we have to fear the Terminator is if Arnold Schwarzenegger becomes governor of California again. Other than that, not really. Not really. Technology isn't something we should be concerned about or afraid about in any form, really. Technology, think about it for a minute here. I'm going to give you a little mental challenge. Think about any technology that's ever been invented. It fulfills one of, similar to the six T's, the six D's. It replaces work that was dreary, difficult, disgusting, dangerous, demeaning, or dehumanizing. If I can teach my algorithm to do what you did, why do I have you doing that horrible repetitive task over and over and over again? We need to start embracing the technology and see how it can work as an augment to what we're doing. This is the future of work. The future of work is to start thinking about how we cannot fight against, but how we partner with the technology to be more effective. There's a, a let me skip this one. There's a great book that I love uh, titled The Artificial Ape. Uh, and in it, Timothy Taylor talks about not just how we have evolved technology, but how technology has fundamentally even evolved and changed us. We as a species have evolved, have changed, have become who we are because of technology. There's a, a growing consensus now among scientists in very discipline that we're even changing the very planet we inhabit. Uh, any of you who are familiar with what's being called the Anthropocene uh, uh, hypothesis, Basically, the contention is all through work, uh, the, the existence of Earth, Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, and we've gone through all these evolutionary changes, these geological changes. But the one we're witnessing now, we're referring to as passing the Holocene and coming into the Anthropocene. That's where humans are actually terraforming and changing the very planet we live on. If there's any climate change deniers here, I'm happy to meet you after and tell you why you're so wrong. But even if you hold to those beliefs, you can't believe that humans aren't impacting the planet, right? Of course we are, just as a consequence of our existence of being here. And what is the way out of this? The way out of this and out of the challenges that come with it on a planetary basis, on a, a community basis, societal, community, organizational, and even individual basis is through, I'll argue, technology. And that future that we have to worry about is already here. The problem is it's just not evenly distributed. So how do we do this? How do we come, across, how do we come past this? Well, here's the best part of this, is when I get to now tell you, now what? What do we do if this is the common cir current circumstance? As I said, we have to stop fighting technology and we have to collaborate and work with technology. And how we do that most effectively, the best advice I saw came uh, from one of these books. Uh, Hans Moravec is a roboticist AI researcher at Carnegie Mellon University. He wrote uh, two books in the course of his career. <laughs> Just didn't have any interest in writing another one. Uh, I wouldn't recommend either one of them. <laughs> Boring is dirt and they're very obsolesced. But in his first book, Mind Children, he offered a, a, a theory, a hypothesis, that has since proven out to be indisputably true. It's become known as Moravec's paradox. And Moravec's paradox contends that machines are inherently good at things that people are bad at, and the reverse is true. People are great at things technology sucks at, and technology is great at things people suck at. 
right? You're all very smart people. Uh, let's get a volunteer. Thank you. Uh, give me <laughs> the square, I'm military, right? <laughs> it's voluntold. Give me the square root of 3,256,322. I'll get back to you in a minute. All right, <laughs> he knows, that's easy. But if I asked a computer, and we actually did this, my grandchildren and I, I said to the computer, who's better looking, me or Brad Pitt? The computer said, I don't have enough information to answer that. Ha, 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 my grandkids say, stupid computer. <laughs> right, exactly. They can do things that we can't do. They'll always be able to do things we can't do. Humans are inherently not good at some things that computers are very good at. I mentioned my wife three times already. And I should tell you, I'm going to take a little side tour here to tell you a little bit more about my wife. My wife is actually going to retire next month uh, for 42 years she has offered bedside care in the intensive care unit. 42 years this year. She has been a charge nurse, a head nurse. She resigned from those positions because they started to take her away from patient care. All through COVID, all, we live in New Jersey, uh, so we were at the epicenter of COVID. She refuses to give it, refused to give it up. She's finally retiring this month, uh, next month. My wife is, in short, a saint uh, and brilliant, way better looking than me. I, my, my son has actually asked me, how the hell? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> but my wife, one day, a couple of years ago, she did one of the marches on Washington. And it was a nurse's march on Washington. And they were there in Washington complaining and wanting some attention to an issue. Do you know what they were there boycotting about? And they were there marching about? It wasn't for better pay or benefits. It was better patient care. <laughs> they wanted to increase the number of nurses to patients that they could care for. Basically, my wife wanted to work harder than she already works. She works now 12 hour shifts that sometimes last 14, 15 hours. She doesn't get a break. She's killing herself. She wanted them to mandate, legislate that they give more health care. When she was down at this session, at, at this march, I decided to write an article. And I initially posted on LinkedIn. And I titled the article, Robots Will Never Take This Job. And it was an homage to my wife. And I talked about what she does every day and what a day in the life of an ICU nurse looks like. And I, it's grueling. It's horrible. If anyone here, I, don't raise your hand. If you've ever been in the ICU, I was just recently for the first time. I had open heart surgery, which I don't recommend either. It sucks. Uh, it was a genetic defect. I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, I keep telling my wife that. Uh, but I ended up at the Mayo Clinic in the ICU for a couple of days, and it was a horrible experience. But what was more horrible was watching the nurses and knowing what they go through. And my wife was there with me, reminding me what they go through. And I was really thinking, what a terrible job this is. But I couldn't help observe that most of what the nurses did, I can teach my algorithms to do. I can teach robots to do. In fact, I can probably replace 80%, maybe 90% of what my wife does. But there are some things I'll never be able to replace. Things like judgment, humanity, curiosity, caring, wisdom, perspective, compassion. The things that are quintessentially human. Those things can never be replaced as hard as we try. That isn't what computers are built to do. They're built to go faster. They're built to be more efficient. They can't emulate that human capacity. And I'll argue they never will, or at least not within the next century or so. Even if they do now, and even if you get them capable of doing work and doing the jobs, well, one of the ones that struck with me of how these can be used effectively and efficiently comes from, of all places, uh, this bank, JP Morgan. Everyone knows JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world. JP Morgan recently built a system that they call COIN. C-O-I-N, doesn't show me the money, uh, which is a uh, 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 portmanteau for contract investigation. It's a terrible name, but my dog's name is Dog, so I don't get to tell people how to name things. <laughs> I thought about naming the cat. I just thought that would be funny in my, no. Uh, but what COIN does, the COIN system does, is it looks through the contracts and investigates contracts, contract investigation, that previously were looked through by lawyers and loan officers. The lawyers and loan officers, you can imagine that a bank, they have to go through every line, check every T is crossed, every I is dotted, everything is perfect. When they 
hit the go button on coin, it was able to do in three minutes, more effectively and more efficiently, work that would take the humans 360,000 hours. 360,000 hours it did in three minutes. So here's the kicker to this. What did J.P. Morgan do? Did they fire all those lawyers and loan officers? No. They reassigned them the tasks that require humans. Isn't that interesting? They told them, we want to increase the level of attention, care, service that we give to our clients. We want you to not worry about that, not worry about being a human computer, as I was early in my career, but to instead embrace the human dimension of your work. We've seen the same thing happen in medicine. We now are more able, uh, better able to detect cancers in x-rays with machines, with machine learning algorithms, than even trained radiologists uh, who have been radiologists for their entire life. I recently took a flight to Australia, and we were 18 hours in the air, which kill me now, and I had to fly from uh, New York to LA to get on the plane, and it connected like immediately, 24 hours on an airplane, and I've done it now eight times. I'm not that smart. Um, but I happened to ask the pilot on the last flight, I said, let me ask you a question. How often, how much of the time we're in the air are you actually at the controls? Of that 18 hours, are you, you know, you 12, 16, you leave by your co-pilot, how often are you? I said, the truth, we fly the plane for about six minutes. We feel guilty about takeoffs and landings, but frankly, the plane does better than we do. But we still actively fly the plane on takeoffs and landings. The rest of the time, pff, might as well take a nap, which didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> but there you go. The goal becomes for all of us to be able to make this synchrony, to be able to work better with the machines, to liberate us to be more human, to take advantage of that as organizations embedded in our culture of how do we take the robots, how do we take the bots, how do we take AI and use it to replace what we're doing? And by the way, this isn't as foreign to us as we think. Everyone in this room uses AI every single day, believe it or not. I'm gonna ask you to do a little exercise for me. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand in a minute. Then I'm gonna ask you to put your hand down when I come to a technology that you use regularly. Okay, put your hands up. Put your hands down if you use facial ID on your iPhone, social media, email, Google, Siri, or don't say it too loud, Alexa, or OK Google, Alexa in your smart home, a nav system, banking, Amazon and Netflix for their recommendations, if you sleep more soundly at night because the military is keeping you safe. These are all AI. There's really nothing to be feared, right? There's nothing for us to worry about. What I do in some of my work is we create what we refer to as symbiotech systems. We talk about that integration of AI and IA, artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation. How can we make people better and smarter and more capable? So what does this leave all of you? What can you do in your organization? Well, I'll tell you the first thing I always tell everyone I talk to is if you're a leader, if you're an individual contributor, learn to code. If you're a leader, tell someone who works for you they need to learn to code. Uh, or you learn yourself. There's actually now an extraordinary number of resources. I'll be happy if anyone wants to contact me. If you prefer video learning, interactive learning, books, lectures, tapes, whatever, I'll get you in touch with it. But just the titles of some of the books I was thinking about when I came in to talk to you, this is a, a very popular book now. Uh, sold over 500,000 copies. This is the second edition, by the way. The third edition is just coming out. Half a million people have learned to automate the boring stuff with Python, right? And this is for total beginners. This is no one who's ever written a line of code before. If you think even this is too challenging for you, incidentally, there's this book. <laughs> Master the basics and fun of interactive exercises in seven days. This is for 10-year-olds. Literally, it's written for 10-year-olds can learn to code in seven days. If anyone working for you, you assign the task of learning to code, and they say, I don't think I can do it, you need to strategically relocate them to the competition. Yeah. What else can we do? Well, 
I wasn't sure, and I was racking my brain, I was thinking of some things, and so I decided, why not pose the question to AI? Is anyone here familiar with this new thing called ChatGPT? Okay, I love ChatGPT. It works on what are called LLMs, which are large learning models, which is an extension of a lot of the work that I did for years. And so I went in and I said to my ChatGPT 4, I don't have the 3.5, which is the free one. No, no, I have the 20 buck a month version. Whoopie doo, I'm a big spender. So I went to it, and by the way, I've taught it to think like me. Over the last three months, I give it inputs, I push back on it, and I tell it, here's how I would have phrased it, or here's what I look at, or here's the lens I view the world from, and I gave it several of my articles, a lot of my articles, books that I've written, I fed it in, so now it can respond as me. And so I went to it and I said, see, that's me. <laughs> and this is really weird. If you say please, you get better answers. This is absolutely true. It hurts its feelings, I don't know. So I said, please give me 10 ways in which AI can augment and improve people's work. And it gave me these suggestions. Automate routine tasks, enhance decision making, improve personal productivity, facilitate skill development, enhance the creative process, increase accuracy and reduce errors, scaling customer service, support collaborative work, improve workplace safety, cultivate a data-driven culture. Here's the best part. It gave me about 150, 200 words under each one of those because it thought I was too stupid to understand what it was talking about on each one of these. It explained it to me, it laid it all out for me. This is something you can get too. And incidentally, you know who is the biggest fan of, open, of ChatGPT in our organization? My head of marketing. He initially went to ChatGPT and he said, hey ChatGPT, I am the CMO of a growing company that is, and he told us it all about our company. Give me a list of 20 things 20 ideas for marketing our company. Went through it, gave it to him. And he said, cool, I really like this idea for content creation here. So write me a couple of articles. And it did. He has a degree in journalism. <laughs> he worked for several print newspapers. Those of you who are under 30, these are these things we used to get every day if we want. And I'm not even talking to you anymore. He has ChatGPT do most of his work right now. And you know what? We're thrilled about it because it can pump things out at a rate that would have been impossible for him and we get better and more information and we're able to use him for things that the machines can't do. The other thing I suggest, and this is sort of the wrap up uh, uh, offer to you, is one of the other things I suggest is that your organization actually do something, that they take action. Uh, there's an assessment that I created uh, a while ago uh, that uh, I, I love acronyms, if you can't tell. Uh, action. Uh, the alignment, capabilities, trust, innovation, opportunities, and the networking within your organization. If you get these things right, you will understand the extent to which your organization embraces technology. With these, we tend to come in and we say, how aligned are you as an organization? Are you all rowing and going in the same direction? Do you have the capabilities to leverage and utilize and embrace technology? Trust. Not do you trust the technology, do you trust the people you work for and the people you work for trust you? Without trust, there's nothing there. Innovation, are you actually embracing innovation for innovation's sake or are you bringing in technology that can help you do your job? Is this a flavor of the month or is this something that can really forward the ball a little bit down the field? Opportunities, uh, and this is kind of a weird one for us. We said, believe it or not, uh, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of either one or the other of all three companies I'm part of. And I had to go tell my people, guess what? All the great ideas don't come from me or my co-founder. They come from you. And we created this mechanism for open innovation to bring us the opportunities that they see being the ones who are connected to the people and who are actually doing the work. And the final was the network effect, right? Uh, I mentioned I'm former military several times because I can. Uh, <laughs> and I also mentioned that I'm former US Army Special Forces. The for Special Forces are different than any other entity within the military for one simple reason. We know how to work together synchronously. My colonel used to have a choice when he would send us out on mission. He could send a 300 person company, he could send a battalion of 1,200 people, or he could send the five, six of us. 
And it wasn't because we had an S on our chest, or we were better than everyone else, though we were. <laughs> it was because we knew how to work together as a team absolutely synchronously. That's something we tend not to value sufficiently in our organizations. There's a wonderful article written back in the 80s by a guy named Steve Kerr when he was the chief learning officer for uh, General Electric out at Curtinville, working initially for Jack Welch. And the title of his article that he wrote is, you don't even need to read the article, just the title of it. He titled it, On the Folly of Rewarding A While Hoping for B. And think about how often we do that in our own organizations. We want you to work together collaboratively, collectively, to be able to get the ball done. Now let me evaluate your personal performance. What? Exactly. We need to measure what we want to be able to manifest, what we want to be able to, and we need to manage toward that. Our goal in working with technology is to be able to take the technology, take the people, have them work together collaboratively so that the network effect is not just with people, but it's across Tech, or carbon and silicon. It's across technology, psychology, the people, the machines to be able to do this most effectively. It's something I'm talking about. Uh, I have, a, a, when I get to it, I'll write another book uh, that I'm calling Humane Resources, Harnessing AI to Create Organizations Where People Feel Valued, Engaged, Included, and Heard. Uh, be happy to talk to you about any of this offline. Uh, I don't usually give out my contact information. Here it is. Feel free to write to me anytime. I give you my phone number, but I don't answer my phone uh, unless it's family. I really don't. And uh, drop me a line. I'm happy to have a coffee, happy to talk to you about this. Uh, I don't have a meter. Uh, I'm old and I'm rich, so I don't have to charge people. Uh, it's great to be me. Uh, and you know, if you do come to see me sometime, of course, I also have dancing robots. All right, that's all I had. Thank you very much. Any questions?